good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations for making it this far into the conference, and thanks for staying with us on the final afternoon. Uh, my name is Martha Stickings, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session on making deinstitutionalization work. Um, in this session, we're going to have some presentations of different national programs uh, to ensure that persons with disabilities can move from institutional settings uh, to live independently in the community. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that we've got a great panel, um, albeit a rather European panel, um, that will be bringing in different experiences from their countries. Uh, I'm going to start off in a few minutes um, talking a bit about some work that my organisation, the Fundamental Rights Agency, has done in this area. Uh, and then you'll hear from Frank uh, Sion from the European Network on Independent Living, uh, from John Healy from Genio in Ireland, from Paraskovia uh, Muntianu, uh, from Keystone Moldova, uh, from Maria um, Borovic from the Centre for Rehabilitation in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, and then last, but certainly not least, um, from Aneta Teneva from the Lumos Foundation. Uh, and then at the end, I hope that we'll have uh, a bit of time for some questions. Um, so if you hear something that you'd like to know more about, uh, then please do take a note and we can come back to that at the end. Could I have the slides up, please? Perfect. Uh, so at the Fundamental Rights Agency, we have just finished uh, a quite a long project that was looking at drivers and barriers of deinstitutionalization. And we did this project because we saw that there was a gap between policy uh, and the commitments that governments and other bodies were making and practice on the ground. And we wanted to try to contribute to helping to close that gap. We did this through fieldwork research in five EU member states, uh, which are Bulgaria, Finland, Ireland, Italy and Slovakia. We wanted to focus our research on where deinstitutionalization is actually taking place. So we had a particular focus on the local level. And we also wanted to make sure that we got as full and holistic an understanding of this process as possible. So we spoke to people that were involved professionally in the deinstitutionalization pro um, process in terms of designing and implementing it, both from the policy side and the practice side. Uh, and that included national and local policy makers, um, the employees of various different community services, as well as managers and staff of institutional and community-based services. But we also wanted to speak to people personally affected by deinstitutionalization. So that's, of course, first and foremost, persons with disabilities, but also their family members and members of local communities, as well as national and local disabled persons organizations. What did we find? Firstly, we found that drivers and barriers of deinstitutionalization are similar across the five countries. Now that presents both opportunities uh, and challenges. Uh, it means that there are significant problems that have to be overcome, but it means that if we can overcome them in one place, then that's gonna help us a lot for overcoming them elsewhere. We also were reinforced very strongly in the view that deinstitutionalization has an overwhelmingly positive impact on persons with disabilities, but more broadly also on the staff working with them and on their communities. What came out really strongly is that meaningful deinstitutionalization requires both a physical and a cultural transformation. So it's not just about where you live, but very much about how you live. And lastly, and less positively, we have to acknowledge that some actors do not support deinstitutionalization. And that's particularly with respect to people with more severe impairments um, and to older people. Drawing on the results of our field work, we identified what we've called five essential features of successful deinstitutionalization. 
These are commitment to deinstitutionalization, and that's in terms of law and policy, but also in terms of a will to make it happen. It's about a change in attitudes towards persons with disabilities, and that's at all levels, from policymakers to the community to society as a whole, and also to the people working with persons with disabilities on a daily basis. It requires active cooperation between all the different people involved, both vertically in terms of between different levels of government, but also horizontally, so between different sectors of, say, employment, health, social services. Fourthly is the question of the practical organisation. So how are you actually going to achieve this? And most importantly of all, how are you going to develop the community-based services that will enable people to live independently? And finally, the availability of guidance. And we heard time and again that people really wanted to achieve deinstitutionalization, but they just weren't sure how. And so having that practical guidance is really important. So trying to break that down a little bit. In terms of the commitment, and we looked and identified drivers and barriers for each of these features. We see that political commitment at both the local and, na and national level is extremely important and that this can come partly from external pressure, including from the media, but also from persons with disabilities demanding deinstitutionalization themselves. In terms of barriers, we see that insufficient, difficult to access and poorly assigned funding is a significant challenge, along with vested interests in maintaining the status quo, and often the ensuing issue um, of deprivation of legal capacity. For attitudes, we have to acknowledge that Many, the, the perceptions of disability and of persons with disabilities very much shape the deinstitutionalization process. And here we saw that often there was concern about the availability of community-based services, fear for people's safety and security in the community, and the residual perception that people with disabilities should be looked after and cared for. In terms of uh, active cooperation, we saw that what can work really well is working groups and networks, as well as informal working relationships, but that it's also important to work beyond the sort of so-called usual suspects, so with families, as well as with third sector organizations and NGOs. And this means also people thinking beyond their own organization, um, as well as ensuring that practitioners at the local level are involved in decision-making processes. In terms of guidance, pilot projects can be a really useful source of guidance, um, as well as uh, input from national policymakers. However, we see that there's really a lack of useful information uh, about how and where deinstitutionalization will take place. And finally, in terms of practical organization, uh, here we have to say that the barriers came very much to the fore. Um, here, the most important one is the continuing lack of appropriate community-based services. And that's both specialized services and also the inaccessibility of general public services. And here also, we see that a significant barrier is that existing staff are worried about what will happen to their working conditions and their jobs in the future. And this can make them a bit reluctant to implement the institutionalization. On the more positive side, uh, we saw that individualized plans, as well as opportunities to develop everyday living skills, can really play a role in helping to drive the deinstitutionalization process forward. We have a huge number of publications uh, on this topic uh, that are available on our website. Um, I also put outside a few copies of the summary of our research as well as the full report. Um, and if you'd like to come and see me afterwards, I'd be very happy also to give you more copies of that. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to hand over to Frank to tell us about Enel's experience. Okay, do. Um, can I have the clicker thing yeah. too? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's. Uh, mm. 
Okay, the green one. So this one. No, that one. That one. Okay, new technology. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm Frank Sihun of the European Network on Independent Living, and uh, I will, yes, it works, I will uh, tell you a little bit more about Enil's work of uh, de institutionalization. But first, I will do a bit of uh, public relations and give you information about Enil. So, who are we? We are a network of um, disabled people with members in uh, 47 countries. Um, so this means that we actually connect disabled people and disabled people organizations to exchange experiences on what is independent living, what are the obstacles, but what are also the solutions. And then we use this information to advocate for better legislation around independent living. As you can see, 47 members means that we are wider than only European Union. So we have members in, in Europe, but also in Africa, in America, and in the Middle East. So um, yes, this is what we do. And we focus a lot on also peer support, so getting people in touch with each other to talk about independent living. You may ask now, what is independent living? Uh, well, <laughs> independent living is choice and control, as we say it. So it is giving every person the support they need, but also the self-confidence they need to make decisions about their own life. And this is closely linked to the topic, it's the institutionalization. So how is the institutionalization working? How can we get people out of institutions back into the community to be able to be in an environment where they can make decisions about their own life? And we see that for the institutionalization to work, there are several, several things that need to be in place. You need to have peer support. You need to have um, some campaigns about stigma and hate crime to actually change the image of disability. You need um, personal assistance and accessibility, but we come back to that in uh, like later points on the presentation. And uh, lastly, as an introduction about ANIL, I would like to invite you all to come to the ANIL Freedom Drive in Brussels from 1 to 3 October this year, where we have a big event where we bring all our members together in Brussels to exchange experiences about independent living. But now, on to the topic and this, yes. Um, so, what is the institutionalization? And what is making decisions about your own life? Um, well. Decisions about your own life are quite straightforward and simple. It's like, who do I want to live with? But also, as Marta was saying, how do I want to live? Where do I want to live? Also, when do I want to wake up? Maybe, do I want to wake up? Um, <laughs> do I want to go to school? And if yes, where? What do I want to eat for dinner, for lunch, for breakfast? Where do I want to go to the movies? To which movie? Do I want to go to a movie theater? in Brussels or in another city. So all these questions are key to actually take control over your own life. And deinstitutionalization is exactly that. It's having the support and the self-confidence and the power to make those decisions. When you cannot make those decisions, it is, well, you are institutionalized. Whether you live alone at one place by yourself, you live with two people, you live with three friends, with six friends. If you don't have the self-confidence and the power and the support to make those decisions and execute them, then you will be institutionalized. And so deinstitutionalization is really as simple as having the power to decide and to carry out uh, all of these questions we all make in our daily life. And it is often illustrated by, um, as you like, in many countries what is now happening in deinstitutionalization is um, governments make new small group homes, like smaller places that are more comfortable for disabled people to live in, that are very nice, very new, uh, very modern. But then still you have, as you can see on the, on the bottom of the slide, these timetables where you have breakfast from 8 to 10 in the morning, then at 12 you have lunch, and then you can go for dinner at 7, and then between 7 and 10 you need to be going to bed because otherwise the support will not be provided. So then, what happens is you have a very nice and comfortable new place, but people are still in the queue for breakfast all at nine in the morning and there is no real possibility to make your own personal choice about when to get up or when to eat or what to eat. And as an example that you probably will all understand is that tomorrow my flight back home is quite early. So 
I will have to get up at three in the morning and in my hotel there won't be any breakfast. So it's quite annoying to have a nice hotel with a very nice uh, breakfast service, but I can't use it because, you know, it's not available at that point. So just imagine being in a hotel for all your life, which is very nice, but where you cannot choose when and what to eat. This will be, I think, annoying for, for most of us. So this is what the institutionalization is. It's giving people the power and the uh, support to really make those decisions. Um, but then now we have clarified a bit the concepts um, and we can move on now to how to make the institutionalization work. It's um, what do we have to do to be successful in the, in the process. And the first thing I think that is important is to put people in the center. Because what happens most of the time is that you have these new small group homes or new settings and um, government says, well, look, we have built this very nice small group home. Would you like to live in it? And maybe the disabled person will be like, well, no, actually not. But then it's like, yes, but we are going to close all the other support services. So, you know, you can either live in it or don't have any support. And then it's like, mm, yeah, well, maybe I will kind of live in the small group home, but it's not really a choice. It's just a choice because there is no other option. So really, the eye should start from different questions. You should ask people, what would you like to do in your life? Give support to people to actually also have peer support and find out what are the options. And then how can we make this work and what support do you need to make it work? Start from individualized support plans and then go to personalized assistance. This can be personal budget, but also other kinds of personal assistance, as we have seen um, during the conference. So this is, I think, the first important step. Secondly, if the clicker, yes, <laughs> it's uh, make mainstream services accessible and community-based services mainstream. Like, of course we need housing. We need accessible, affordable housing. But why does it need to be special housing? Because now, when disabled people go to um, find for accessible flats, often they are faced with the fact like, oh no, these are service flats, these are especially for old people, or these are especially for um, large families or whatever. But like mainstream social housing, it's not accessible. So instead of doing special houses, we should have just accessible houses. The same goes with transport, with uh, education. Instead of making it special and segregated, make it inclusive and mainstream. So the institutionalization is not only social policy, it is all policies, not transport going to social welfare once it becomes accessible. Then lastly, or thirdly, give disabled people equal legal standing. Um, because nowadays, disability is still measured as inability to work. Um, for instance, I recently took out a bank loan and on the paper for the bank loan it says permanently incapable of working and then right underneath it it says full-time employed, which is a bit strange. <laughs> um, but um, so yes, yeah, so this is still uh, the case in many countries and uh, gives a difficulty for disabled people. Also, as we heard today, legal capacity is not a given and disabled people still don't have uh, equal rights to services, uh, equal access to services like illustrated uh, last month in Belgium when a disabled person was asked to leave a theater because he was applauding too much while actually he paid for this theater and was advised never to come back to the theater. So it was like a bit, mm, when you would have done, done that to another group of people, news would have been different. Um, then, we now know how the institutionalization can be put in place. So, how can we make it work in practice? Do you need a roadmap? And then I say, look at documents that are produced by the FRA, but also by the European Expert Group on the Institutionalization. And more recently, general comment number five of the UNCRPD committee, which says that no investment should be made in institutions, only in individualized services. Um, and that's it, because my time is up. Um, but here is a summary of what I said, and if you have any questions, please ask, and also you can always send me an email, uh, and I'll be here after. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, I think it's a good reminder that um, before we have discussions about how to achieve deinstitutionalization, we need to make sure we have a really clear idea of what independent living actually means. Um, and I think the, the questions you were posing as starting questions um, represent a really good place to begin that process. 
Uh, now I'd like to turn to John Healy uh, from the Genio Foundation in Ireland. Uh, and this is the first of the three innovative practices that we're very privileged to have on this panel. So John. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about the work of Genio. Um, it's an organisation which works in close collaboration with the Irish Health and housing departments and also with the HSE, but particularly closely with service providers and with people who use services as well. Um, at our core is a value around putting people at the core of the, the, the service reform that we work on. And I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll talk through an example of moving from the pilot projects to more sis systemic innovation and more systemic uh, reform. So both Frank and Martha have talked you know, with, with great detail and, and really brought to life, I suppose, the, um, the challenges of living within institutions and also, the, I suppose, some of the, the, the barriers to change. What I want to do is focus in on the, the kind of step up from pilots to trying to do this work at a greater scale at a national level. And in particular, I'll draw on the example of an initiative called the Service Reform Fund, which is a collaboration between state funding philanthropic funding and Genio in, in the Republic of Ireland. So Genio started off about 10 years ago in 2009 um, with pilot projects and funding primarily pilot projects in, sorry, oh, um, sorry, the, the slides seem to have got a bit, oh, there we go. Um, so modeling mainly through pilots, so funding, training, research, providing some resource, resources for community connecting within the Republic of Ireland. So this was, I suppose, working with those people that put their hands up, who really wanted to engage with, in the change, those service providers that were perhaps more progressive and that had a view that, you know, this wasn't the way that things should be and wanted to move away from uh, providing congregated institutional supports to support people to live uh, more independent uh, lives in community. So there were processes put in place, um, as Martha highlighted, you know, the, the kind of personalized approach to planning. And in particular, there were fairly intensive training uh, programs run with staff. And again, they were focused very much on trying to shift people's mindsets and practices. And the primary way that they did that was by working with individuals that they were supporting and really awakening within the staff a curiosity around the capacity of the people that they were supporting. The people themselves were exposed to different aspects of community life and again with real attempts to put in place high expectations for, for those individuals including employment and all the, I suppose, the, 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 the mainstream, if you like, normal stuff that, that, that each one of us would uh, have come to expect as, you know, what, what, what we would, would hope for, for ourselves and for our loved ones. There were transformative outcomes in the pilot. So again, similar to the, the previous presenters, it was demonstrated to a high degree of rigor that this could work. It could work for anyone, which was again, that really important point that it wasn't just for the, you know, you're scooping the cream off the top. It was really, the, the, the work was tested right across a range of kind of areas. And in some of the, the areas that were considered, I suppose, some of the darker corners of the disability services in Ireland. And what was also found was that the, the models were also cost effective. You know, by and large, when you added up the costs of, of institutional provision with living in the community, um, again, with rigorous cost benefit analysis done, it was shown that it was either equal cost or in some cases there were cost savings to be made. However, what we found was after doing a lot of the, the, the research, you know, doing very rigorous kind of assessments, that the models and the, the, the training and the wasn't enough. What you ended up with was really policy over on one side, which was the good life. And you had, you know, I suppose very, very progressive policy in Ireland around deinstitutionalization, but on the other side of the Gulf were practices and mindsets, which by and large were still fairly traditional in terms of the, 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 the models of support. You had current structures and services, and the people running those services at senior levels 
oftentimes had a sort of unspoken rule that what they were doing was running underfunded services and they were the thin line between chaos and you know, actually keeping the, the, the train on the tracks. So engaging in discussions about reform were challenging, particularly where people had kind of, I suppose, told themselves the story that this was the best thing that could be done at both a, a frontline staff and a more senior staff level in terms of current service provision. There was also obviously budgets, and budgets are sort of like a window into the soul of reform efforts. You know, and particularly moving budgets, as we all know, is very, very tough. So as in many other countries in Ireland, a lot of the budgets were locked into uh, providing more congregated uh, type services. The biggest challenge though in all of this is that a lot of these challenges couldn't be discussed because you had the policy over on one side and practice on the, on the other. So even engaging in discussions and making, if you like, the kind of the Gordian knots or the challenges, you know, to be, begin to kind of unspool them was a, a challenge in itself. So what we did was kind of engage, I suppose, with the reality of the, the current system. And that was, to skip through this fairly quickly, there was fairly rigid kind of criteria associated with people's deficits. Families were, all, were often frustrated. They were often left out in the cold and felt that they hadn't been consulted. And oftentimes, you know, had, I suppose, entered into kind of relationships with staff around the care and support, which were fairly hard, again, to kind of unwind in the sense that choices have been made years previous around what was best for their loved ones. There was a lots of superficial change processes, so lots of very superficial training and lots of tools and processes, which at a veneer kind of superficial level made it look like change was taking place, but oftentimes the when you looked beneath the surface, it was people really, were really ticking a box, really than rather than pushing for the best and highest outcome for, for individuals. And the services as a whole were, were quite reactive and crisis-driven because of the, the the increased regulation of the sector, and again the kind of narrative that this was a service, I suppose, that was underfunded. There was, I suppose, a an approach which tended to focus on you know, managing the day-to-day -day rather than having a, a long-term point of view. And everyone told themselves the story that this was the best that could be done. So in terms of what we've learned about influencing national systems, again, the pilots were very useful in terms of building the coalition and you know, bringing forward the champions. And there's people here actually today, like Selena Doyle from St. Patrick's, who were there in Kilkenny in Ireland who were there at the, the, the fore of this movement as it grew. And those service providers, the family members, the, and the people themselves were really at the fore. And the people who were supported, the stories that they have about the change process that they've gone through, what we found is that it's not just that those stories are good to share in terms of the convincing staff and you know, convincing families that this is doable. It's essential in terms of actually the systems change work as well. There's a need to, correct, to create a protected budget to target at the change. And then also to start with the components of the service. Again, to deal with the reality and to deal with the reality of those mindsets that you've got to, to encounter. So if people are primarily concerned about cost, you've got to meet them at that level. And then what we've done is also made the challenges discussable. So we've tried to use an action inquiry method to encourage learning and adaptation. So what I'd like to finish on is a, a slide, or sorry, a video, uh, which is very short, which just kind of brings this to life. Historically, disability services tended to be delivered in very large congregate settings, otherwise known as large-scale institutions, um, where people lived very um, shallow lives from the point of view of not being able to live to their full potential. John would be in, in St. Raphael's for the best part of over 30 years, actually. And it's, it's kind of a hard say, thing to say that it served its purpose, but there was no alternative, really. All majority of Margaret's life that she remembers has been living on campus in an institutional setting. Martin is a 50-year-old gentleman and um, he has lived in St. Patrick's since he was a young boy. Martin had just withdrawn from life. He chose to spend much of his day in bed, uh, to the point of nearly 90% of his time. We actually thought he was near the end of life, so his life expectancy and what we expected, it was a very short period of time. 
Service Reform Fund on its very simple level is about transforming lives. It's about uh, facilitating people to live ordinary lives in ordinary places. Partnership is fundamental to the Service Reform Fund. Um, it involved um, not just the Health Service Executive but multiple other agencies um, along with Atlantic Philanthropies and Genio, the Department of Health and other key departments were very much behind this initiative. We all came together as a group and we started then specifically looking at the individual needs of people here who had to move off um, site and move into community homes. We've done quite a bit through SRF on capacity building, on changing behaviours to ensure that that value system, which is about person-centred approaches, is actually realised. They begin to see the individual for who they are. They begin to come out of their shell. They, they can make choices. It is possible. To, no matter what the level of disability, that person can participate in their life with support and not just receive care. In 2015, it was a struggle for him to walk around the building. Now he can, he can walk four care objects and up the hills, powering away. He's no longer on an end-of-life care plan. He's involved in the shopping and preparing of his own meals. Margaret's sister had contacted me recently about buying our clothes. And she just said to me, she says, I'm sick of buying her teddy bears. You know, she, she's not a child anymore. Margaret was always the little sister they had to mind, whereas now they were seeing her as an adult. And that was the intentional work that the staff team done to, you know, they have her dressed in appropriate clothes, they bring her shopping to appropriate places. He's his own person, which he has never been for such a long time, really. And he can make decisions, what he wants to do. You know, it's, it, it's just like, coming out of a winter, and a long winter, and just coming out into a bit of sunlight. Thank you very much um, for, I think, really highlighting the extent of the systemic change that needs to happen, um, but also the really positive outcomes that that can achieve. Um, now I'd like to turn to Paraskovia um, from Keystone, Moldova. Thank you, Marta. I'm delighted to present here at Zero Project Keystone, Moldova experience. Um, and. Uh, the Practice Community for All Moldova uh, program. Keystone Moldova, it's a um, non-governmental organization uh, working uh, for people and with people uh, with disabilities. And I want to mention uh, that um, Keystone uh, is, uh, was founded, uh, Keystone Moldova was founded by Keystone Human Services International from US. And uh, Community for All Moldova program uh, supports the government on development, the legal framework on social inclusion uh, in line with UNCRPD. Uh, also, um, the program supports the institutionalization and community-based services development, inclusive education, labor inclusion, uh, social entrepreneurship, uh, communication, advocacy, self-advocacy, and media advocacy to promote the rights of the persons with disability, and of course, co uh, capacity building, consultancy, and research. What does it mean Community for All Moldova program? First of all, we are talking now about the institutionalization. And within the program, Keystone Moldova is supporting people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities to move from big residential institution into community-based services or to return back uh, into their biological or extended family or to live independently. Also, social inclusion in our um, uh, philosophy means access to mainstream services, human rights, labor inclusion in open labor market, or self-employment um, uh, based on person-centered planning, social role valorization, community support, and rights-based approach. What are the problems targeted by Community for All Moldova program? When we started, 
in Moldova, it was a prevalence of medical, uh, uh, of, um, medical model of disabilities. It was no commitment of public authority for social inclusion and right protection. It was no inclusive legal, legal framework. People with intellectual disabilities lived in segregated facilities in awful conditions. Also, it was a high level of discrimination towards persons with disabilities. The lack of community-based services, limited capacities of mainstream ser services uh, to address the issue on social inclusion. And of course, the lack of financial uh, resources to develop new community-based services. All the, these problems forced persons with disabilities to remain in segregated residential institutions. The innovative aspects of the Community for All Moldova program um, consist on providing support at all three, uh, all three levels. First of all, at individual level, to empower and to engage persons with disabilities to promote their right and to promote the institutionalization. At community level, to prepare the environment at community level and to, support, to provide support close to the persons. At society level, we worked a lot on advocacy for a legal framework in line with CRPD and raise awareness. What are the impact of, this, uh, of the program? First of all, I want to mention that um, within the program, Keystone Moldova succeeded to pilot 10 new models of community-based services. The services aimed to deinstitutionalize persons with disabilities and also to prevent institutionalization. For, for the first time, we piloted housing, housing services. 14 houses have been purchased from donor funds, but after the uh, few years, the public authorities took the decision and they bought other 13 houses from the st state budget. We managed and we supported about uh, 300 people with disabilities to move out of institutions. And um, also, uh, um, very big impact was uh, that all the services that we piloted, developed, have been approved by the government, and now they are paid from the state budget. The government now is committed for the institutionalization the last two years, it was approved at the government level to very important policy paper. Uh, it's a um, national program on, on social uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities aimed to, aimed to, uh, 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 to implement CRPD convention and national program on the institutionalization of persons with disabilities and, um, psycho, uh, and uh, with intellectual disabilities uh, aim to close the institution in Moldova. The, sex, uh, the success factors uh, in, uh, that enabled us to have a holistic approach to move forward the uh, DI process in Moldova where um, the partnership and dialogue with public authorities, engagement and participation of persons with disabilities, civil society organization in advocacy and policy implementation, coordination of external assistance in the field of DI and community development, and of course, uh, advocacy for efficient use of public financial resources and contribution of donor organization uh, for uh, DI process uh, in Moldova. Of course, um, we reached a lot of good examples and results in Moldova on DI process, but uh, we need to work more and more 
because Keystone Moldova, I want to say, didn't complete its goal. In big residential institution uh, are still living now uh, about 2,000 people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very relieved to see that some of the success factors you identified match the ones that we had identified. Um, but also thank you for reminding us about the importance of taking a human rights basis um, for this work. And also on reflecting on uh, the different levels um, in which we need to engage. Uh, and now I'd like to hand over to Maria Borovec um, from the Center for Rehabilitation in Zagreb. Thank you, Marta. Uh, it's great to be here in the same mindset with hearts full. And uh, I realized that some lines in our slides are the same. So I greet uh, you from uh, in behalf of all our beneficiaries and employees from Center for Rehabilitation Zagreb in Croatia. And let me remind you that all these information is according to our center. It's not, these are not the numbers in the whole Croatia. So, who are we? The Center for Rehabilitation Zagreb is a governmental institution funded by the national budget. It provides uh, the whole uh, variety of social services from early childhood till adulthood for people with intellectual disabilities and multiple difficulties. Uh, today, uh, we are 65 years old and we uh, have more than 600 beneficiaries and more than 220 employees. After the 60 years, in 2012, the social politics uh, turned toward the support in the community, and we started the process of transformation and deinstitutionalization, which ended up in 2013 uh, starting the community-based supported housing in the Zagreb and is provided ever since. Today, we have 91 beneficiaries in 21 community flights, apartments and houses in all parts of Zagreb and depending on the size of these uh, um, apartments, people, one to six people live in them. And let me remind you that during this process, nobody was left behind. In our supported housing in the community, live people with severe intellectual and multiple difficulties. People with uh, severe intellectual disabilities and mental health problems with appropriate support live in the community. It is possible. And people also needing life-saving equipment live in the supported housing in our programs. And these people are our goals and our motivation. So, what is next? We, people moved from the institution to the community. So they changed the addresses, beds. We believe that the moving to the community is just a necessary precondition to start the life in the community and to be involved. So, we believe that we don't satisfy with integration. It's just not enough. We could go on using services in the institution, but are these services for all citizens? Or there are services and resources in the community that can people with disabilities also use as everyone, everybody else? So, this is the path of social, social inclusion that we choose using tools which help us to understand people's needs. First of all, person-centered planning, which shows us the needs and wishes 
and forces of the person and the direction in which he wants or she wants to lead her life with special emphasis on the environmental, natural support, not only by the paid staff, and also using the tool of support intensity scale, which show us, shows us the time, the methods, and the quantity of support each one of our beneficiary needs. And uh, joining to those uh, tools is also very important active support which means that people with disabilities take control over their lives and make decisions. So today, people in uh, supported housing in, in the community of Zagreb work meaningfully in inclusive workshops. They also, few of them have jobs on, on the open labor market and they participate participate in over than 30 formal activities in the community. Activities like sports, arts, religious, fan clubs, and so on. They are present, they are visible, they are using the resources that are meant for all of us, and they use public transportation, and they learn every day, and they teach every day, all of us, to understand and be aware, and this is the way we think that the pre prejudice can be reduced slowly, but it can. So, on the one side of the support scale are the people with severe disabilities, and they need more support. And on the other part of the scale are people with high level of independence, choosing activities in the community. So few of them are athletes, and few of them choose Taekwondo, for example, in Zagreb. So uh, we made a partnership be, uh, between Center for Rehabilitation Zagreb, community supported, uh, uh, supported housing in community with Combat Center Zagreb. And our beneficiaries started to practice and train this kind of sport in the community. And uh, people, sometimes when medias are interested in their results, they ask me, uh, what is the impact of the practice? How do they enjoy? What does the sport mean to them? And I like to answer, it means to them what it means to you and me. There is no difference. So today, uh, uh, the number of teams and participants uh, increased by 300%. Our combat center uh, established the Croatian Para Taekwondo Committee, which became the member of Para Croatian Paralympic Committee. Croatian Paralympic Committee is the part of the International and Europe uh, Para Taekwondo Federation and uh, in, at the Paralympic, uh, Paralympics in 2020, the Para Taekwondo will be first presented and our athletes will also compete. And a few weeks ago, they returned from Turkey, winning fourth place for Croatia, winning bronze medal and fifth medal uh, for their effort. So, after the five years of program, I can say that living in the community means the, the real, uh, realized developmental potentials for each one of them, and they continually uh, and personally develop. They have a freedom of choice, and they are a part of the society being and using the resources. And some of them even have employment opportunities more than before. And for most of them, after living in the community, the level of support need is reduced and is reducing all the time. So uh, many of our beneficiaries lived for the most of their lives in the institution. They were brought to Zagreb uh, when they were babies, and now they're participating in many, many activities 
living fulfilled life. It's just the beginning, and next year we'll talk about their next steps. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria, um, for particularly highlighting the really crucial role of employment and particularly employment on the open labour market, uh, as well as the huge variety of different ways to really get involved in the life of your community. Uh, we have to remember that independent living is only one aspect, the independence, um, but also the community aspect is just as important. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to turn to Aneta Taneva um, from Lumos Foundation. Thank you. Hope this works. Yeah. Hello. I will start directly because so many things I, I agree on that table, so I'll try to avoid any repetition. But uh, there is something I cannot understand. Um, some of you may be m met today, these young people, self-advocates from Lumos, who presented and performed uh, their theatrical uh, thoughts and images of uh, institutions and uh, independent living. And they told us, they told us that uh, every child has a right to a family. It is so simple. And there is 80 year research of uh, proves the harm of institutions for child's life and brain development. But still, we have to re remind ourselves uh, ourselves that, and still we have to share that with the world. So LUMOS developed a very flexible reform model which, is adopt, which can be adapted and that could be uh, really used in implemented in different cultures in different, uh, in different countries. So we started in Eastern Europe and Africa and more recently in Latin American, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I will go very briefly through the model we developed. Uh, I'm conscious of time, of course. So these are, um, yeah, this is something I'm sure that in the venue everybody will agree with. And these are countries we work uh, in. So we, we work on seven levels, from the individual child through to international decision makers and donors. And um, LUMOS model has 10 elements which could be implemented in different countries. The process is not linear, so these are not just steps, but equally important elements. Um, the first one, communications and awareness raising a key moment is really an open and transparent communication through the whole process of closing institutions and running community-based services. So it's the right messages from the very beginning of the process until the end of the process is crucial because it could, be, it could, save, it could save even money, it could, reduce the, uh, the, it could reduce the resistance and it could not harm children. Managing the process. Proper managing, management is vital. Um, time, capacity, resources shall be very carefully analyzed and, planning, and planned because a lack of expertise in, in this, in managing the change, could be harmful for children as well. Strategic review on national level. It's about knowledge of scope, scale, and nature of the process. Uh, current knowledge of current legislation is important as well. Strategic review on regional and local level, it's about deeper analysis of the concrete situation of children, concrete reasons of entering institutions, resources, costs. So from our experience, and my colleagues and previous presenters said about piloting, piloting in different, uh, different um, piloting reforms in two or three regions uh, is very effective as well. So LUMOS began working in Moldova in 2006 uh, and uh, along with several other NGOs, uh, we supported the government to make the reform by setting up these demonstration programs. So for 10 years, the number of children in institutions has reduced by 88%. 
and something specific for Moldova that Lumos worked with the government to develop legislation and design a joint reform model combining DI and inclusive education. And with the Ministry of Finance to develop a model of ring fence, protect the budget of institutions when they enclosed and obliged to transfer finance to inclusive education, foster care, family support system, and small number of small group homes. Uh, service design, it's about work with local authority, NGOs, government, to decide on services based on three on data from the th uh, third and fourth element of this uh, uh, reform. Planning the transfer of resources, it's about it, it includes really reinvestment in three areas, financial, material, and human, and convincing all still stake stakeholders that DI is possible. Nobody will lose job, nobody will lose resources or political power because of that. So I will give a very short example of my country, Bulgaria. Lumos started working in Bulgaria in 2009 when the government was developing its vision for the institutionalization of children in Bulgaria, and we created two demonstration regions. Um, since LUMOS began working in Bulgaria, the number of children uh, in institutions has reduced by 86%. So we help with financial analysis that shows that all services cost 37 million euro per year comparing to spending before the reform, 44 million euro. And still money goes to very expensive and not full in residential institutions because in Bulgaria we still have approximately 600 children in these places. Assessing planning and preparation of individual children, very, very important time and very important process. It's about holistic individual assessment individual care and placement plan, and time, time for each child. Because this process, and we have evidences, could be really good one, but it could be terrifying for children to move from these big institutions that they recognize like homes to the new places. Workforce development and deployment, it's about training and guidance for all is required here because, especially for the old personnel and hiring new specialists and of course a lot of supervisions uh, are important to be delivered here. Planning logistics, administration and management, it sounds boring, but actually the right time, right order of different steps is very, very important for the reform, again, again not to, to harm children and monitoring and evaluation through the whole process is needed because the best effect of DI is change in health, development, and life changes of the child. So I, I'm really conscious of time. I would like to talk about some improvements and achievements in Czech Republic, in Haiti, and other countries we work in different, uh, on different levels. I would just want to mention at the end uh, four cross-cutting considerations. And one is respect all children's rights. They told us in Moldova, we are not furniture, we have rights. Uh, child protection, do not harm. It's the, our special motto. Resource each element of the reform. And the last but not least, ask children. Uh, so we ask ourselves all the time two questions. In whose interest we are making decisions? And do we make these decisions with children? Asking them what is really important for them. Because our final goal is to improve their lives, not our plans. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I started this session by talking about the importance of the availability of guidance. Uh, and so it's great to close it with such a good example um, of the guidance that is already available. Uh, I think we have a few minutes that we can take one question, possibly two questions, um, from the audience. So please um, signal if you have a question that you would like to ask to the panel.
Please, go ahead. Sorry, it will be a translation from me because Miss Titova speaks only Russian. Belarus. We are from Belarus. Uh, have a Franku. I have a question for Frank. Um, I agree totally, especially I share your vision on group homes. Uh, Мое мнение, что люди должны жить там, где они жили э, всегда, и получать помощь из местного сообщества. Да. Но вы ну, как бы, э, дали критику групповым домам, но не рассказали, что, как вы видите, как должны жить люди, в общем-то, в том числе и с тяжелыми нарушениями интеллекта. As far as I understood, you criticized a little bit group home models, but I want to hear the alternatives, especially for people with severe multiply injuries and disability, in your point of view. Um, thanks for the question. It's a very good question. And um, I think the best way to explain, as I, as I, as I uh, mentioned also in the presentation, is give people choices and like real choices about what they want to do in their life and give them the support to execute those choices. Also for people with intellectual disability, you can give the support they need to actually first of all, be aware of the choices and then give them support and assistance to um, carry them out. For instance, when you have um, a person with, with complex needs, complex support needs, moving away from institutional care or a group setting to um, a, like living in the community, maybe at first it will be very um, challenging and also for the person it might be very, very challenging to actually imagine something else as living in, in a group setting. But then through um, peer support, like making this person also talk with other people in same situations, maybe people um, with uh, similar support needs, this person can actually then discover that there are other options and then work with the person to see what kind of support the person needs to really carry out those options and then try it and see if it's possible for the person to live alone or maybe to live with two people or three people depending on the choice of this person and the other person this person might then live with. Um, try and see what works, which support works. If it doesn't work, you can readjust, re evaluate the support needs and try something else. But the key thing is that you involve the person, talk with the person and start from their choices, not only start from a like preset um, section of, of options, but tailor the options specifically to what the person wants and then needs. And I think that is the, the way of looking at the institutionalization is really making sure that people can have choices and that they can make their own choices, that they're not limited by the conveniently available choices, but that they can also make radical choices and then get support to, to carry them out. Uh, I hope, um, does this answer your question or not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, we had one other hand, so we have one quick question and hopefully a quick response. Um, Karin Onnes from Styria, from an umbrella organization of service providers. I have a question to Mr. Healy. Um, you talked about that there are paradigms and there is a taboo about practices, that practices are not talked about. Um, so my question is from your experience, is it, if you would have to put in a priority, is it more important to to start talking about practices or to change practices in cer certain areas and then talk about this? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, there are the two avenues that you can go down, which is to operate below the radar. So, for example, things like that at a national level, say, for example, practices in relation to organized labor, so unions. You know, taking on unions that are a very powerful lobby, very overtly and very challengingly, 
can be one way to go about doing change, you know. So another way can be to do things below the radar and to negotiate at a local level um, and to kind of broker compromise to get the staff to come along. And in some ways, you know, situations like that, you could make a case that in certain, if you're trying to grow, particularly at the early stages, that it's better to do the, 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 the kind of the below the radar when you're still weak as a movement. And then as you grow, to formalize it more and to engage in the more structured kind of approaches where you need to make this, you know, these types of approaches available and common practice. Um, so I suppose my opinion would be that at certain stages in the process, doing things below the radar is appropriate. But as you then come to, at a national level, certainly you need to engage in a more structured way, which, you know, can be very challenging. And again, I'm sure there's people in the room here with very direct experience of that, you know, the, the slow kind of bit by bit, you know, struggle, which this kind of deinstitutionalization de work can be. And you're oftentimes growing from those pilots, but at some stage then you do need to be mainstreaming this into policy level or practice levels at a national level, not just espoused or aspirational policy. Does that answer the question? Thank you very much, um, and I think that's a good place to finish, how we can aspire to turn pilot practices uh, into really the systemic change that we need to achieve. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank all of the panelists, um, Paraskovia, uh, John, Aneta, Maria, and Frank um, for their contributions, and to thank all of you for being here uh, and for their excellent questions, um, and wish you all a very good weekend. Thank you.